In this video, we're going to take a moment to review the material for uh, AP Bio Unit 1. My name is Mr. Chipman. I am the biology teacher at Murray High School in Murray, Kentucky. So let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, real quick, just to review the structure of an atom. Um, an atom is composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons. The protons are positively charged and the neutrons have no charge and this represents the nucleus of the atom. And the electrons are negatively charged and they can be found around the nucleus of the atom. And the electrons are primarily what's going to be involved in chemical bonding and what's going to cause an atom to be heard or a molecule to behave in a certain way, which brings us to the structure of a water molecule. A water molecule is composed of one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. The oxygen atom has eight protons and eight electrons. The hydrogen atoms have one proton and one electron each because there's two hydrogen atoms. Protons and electrons are really attracted to each other and the protons do not leave the nucleus. They stay right there in the nucleus. So the, and the electrons are free to float around and because the water molecule, the atoms in the water molecule are covalently bonded, they share those electrons. And so you have 10 electrons that are associated with this hydrogen or this water molecule, eight for the oxygen and one for each hydrogen. And oxygen, because it has eight protons, is those uh, electrons are going to spend most of their time associated with that pile of eight. It would be like if you had a giant magnet on a wall and a small magnet on the wall and you threw a handful of paper clips at it. Which magnet is going to attract the most electrons? Are the most paper clips in this case? Well, it's going to be the big one, of course. It doesn't mean that the smaller one, it doesn't mean that the electrons aren't always down here next to the hydrogens, but it just means that they spend most of their time near the oxygen. And so what this causes water to do is polarize or have opposite ends, whereas the oxygen end of the mat <clears throat> molecule tends to have a slightly negative charge and the, the positive or the hydrogen ends of the molecule tend to have a slightly positive charge. And this causes water to behave in different ways. Water, because it's polar, with the oxygen being negative and the hydrogens being positive, it's going to behave in different ways and say methane, which is a nonpolar because all of the electrons are equally shared. A good way to think of polarity is the unequal sharing of electrons. So that's going to cause water to behave in lots of different ways because of the unequal sharing of electrons. Water is going to be highly attracted to itself. For instance, the oxygen end of the molecule is going to be attracted to the positive end or the hydrogen end of another water molecule. And in fact, Next, sorry. In fact, water will attract four other, each water molecule will attract four other water molecules to be attracted to it. And so water really likes itself quite a bit. Uh, water's a tendency to stick to itself is what we call cohesion. Water's tendency to stick to other things that are have a polarity is called adhesion. You know, like water will stick to glass, for instance. And it's water's ability to stick to glass or other sorts of charged substances that can cause water to travel long distances up tiny tubes, like uh, say up the plant, like up a plant, like a tall tree. The water's able to reach the highest heights of those trees because it loves itself. And so it's pulling itself up the tube, but it's also able to grab a hold of the sides of those little tubes that are called xylem and able to pull itself up. This is called capillary action. Because water is able to form so many bonds with itself, each one of these bonds is called a hydrogen bond that, wa that polar molecules form with itself. Because water is able to make so many bonds with itself, then it's hard to break those bonds. It takes a lot of energy. And so water can hold a lot of energy before it breaks. So sometimes you'll see it uh, as a high specific heat and has, is able to hold lots of energy or high heat capacity. And as water becomes slower, the angle of this, these, this molecule here will actually decrease, causing water to push out from itself, not want to be near itself. Those positive and positives don't like each other. And this causes water to be less dense as a solid. And so this water's polarity causes it to act in a lot of different ways. And this is important for uh, biological 
systems because this hydrogen bond here is the most important bond in living systems because of its uh, ability to be broken easily yet to still form a bond. And that brings us to the 1.2 elements of life. Uh, and this is the this is the idea that matter and energy are conserved in living systems. Uh, energy is lost slowly in living systems through entropy, but matter is going to be conserved. Matter is not going to be lost. This gazelle is eating grass, and it's going to use that grass to make more of itself, and then those cheetahs are going to eat that gazelle, and it's going to use the parts of the gazelle to make more of themselves. So they are essentially using the grass in that way. And then as Mufasa told us long ago, they will die and become the grass. The grass will use the remains of the cheetah to make more of itself and the circle of life continues. Well, what does that have to do with biological molecules? Well, biological molecules are made up of several different pieces, but there are a few that we're going to talk about that are essential. Carbon being the main one, carbon is going to be found in all organic molecules as sort of a backbone for those molecules. You can see it in this picture forming the backbone for each of those molecules. And the bond, carbon is able to bond with four different things. And so it can bond with itself. It can double bond with itself. As you see here, it's called tetravalence, meaning it has four valence uh, spots. And it's able to bond with lots of things, so it's able to form these backbones. You see it in all major macromolecules. You see it in nucleic acids, lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins. Nitrogen is another one that is able to form lots of different bonds, thus making it very versatile. Nitrogen is not found as, as, in as many macromolecules as uh, carbon is found in. Carbon is found in all of them. Nitrogen is primarily found in DNA and proteins. Well, phosphorus is another important uh, element found in macromolecules, and it is going to be found mainly in nucleic acids, though it is also important in the formation of structures called phospholipids, which make up the cell membranes. And that brings us to 1.3, which is the introduction of biology or biological macromolecules. Macromolecules are made up of monomers or individual units, and those individual units join together to form polymers. In macromolecules, those monomers join together through covalent bonds. A covalent bond is where bonds are sharing electrons. We talked about that with water already. The unequal sharing of electrons is called polarity, but in a lot of them, there's an equal sharing here. So you can see that there's equal sharing. Covalent bonds are the strongest type of chemical bonds that we're going to talk about in this class. But Depend, it doesn't matter what type of macromolecule are joining together. Here you have two carbohydrates that are joining together, two glucose molecules joined together through a covalent bond, and it's called uh, maltose at this point. So it has a different takes on a different chemical property when the two glucoses become one maltose. They form that covalent bond. The different macromolecules that we're going to talk about in the class are carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids, and proteins. And they're made up of individual pieces. And you can see here, not that important, um, but you, you can see the individual pieces that they're made up of. Um, carbohydrates are made up of individual pieces called monosaccharides, lipids, fatty acids. Nucleic acids are made up of individual nucleotides. And proteins are made up of individual amino acids. We will spend quite a bit of time talking about nucleotides and amino acids. How two molecules are joined together is a process called dehydration synthesis. Look at the two words. Dehydration means to pull water out, right? Synthesis means to, to combine something. So when you synthesize, you're making something. And so literally water is being pulled out. You can see two H's and an O are being pulled out in order to join these two molecules together. So when two molecules or two mono, monomers of macromolecules are joined together, the process is called dehydration synthesis. Here you see two carbohydrates joining together. Here you see two amino acids joining together, which are the building the building blocks of proteins. But it's the same thing. H2O is taken out. They form a covalent bond together. The opposite of this is called hydrolysis. Hydro means water. Lysis means to break. And so this is using water to break something. Here you have a triglyceride, which is three fatty acids joined together to make a lipid. Water is added to that 
and thus causing those molecules to break apart into individual fatty acids. Here you have hydrolysis for a nucleic acid. You have multiple nucleic acids or multiple nucleotides joined together. Water is added, thus causing them to break apart. And that brings us to 1.4 properties of biological molecules. We're going to be looking at the structure and function of some different molecules here, uh, mainly nucleotides, proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates. Here's a nucleotide. Nucleotides are made up of three parts, phosphate, pentose, sugar, which is just a five-carbon sugar, and nitrogenous base. And the nitrogenous bases are like the A's and T's, C's and G's of DNA. Proteins. Um, are made up of nucleic acids, or made up of amino acids, sorry. And each one of these amino acids have a particular structure to them. They all look like this. The R is the, it's called the R group. It is the only uh, variable portion of an amino acid. Everything else that you see here is going to be the same. The um, N terminus portion or the amino terminus portion of this group is going to be here, this NH2, whereas the carboxyl terminus portion or the C terminus portion is going to be this carboxylic acid. And so you, that's why it's called an amino acid. And they're going to have this particular sort of direction every time. Amino acids, here's a picture of them joining together. Again, H2O is taken out, joined together, forming a peptide bond. Um, there are 20 different naturally occurring amino acids found in the human body, and you don't need to know all of them, but they act in different ways. So some of them are nonpolar, some of them are polar, some of them are acidic, some of them are basic. And the, the idea here is that when a protein is formed, and there are several thousand amino acids involved in that formation, the amino acids themselves and the chemical nature of those amino acids is going to cause the protein to behave in a certain way. It's in, in fact, it's going to kind of fold up and the parts that like each other are going to get near each other and the parts that don't like each other are going to get away from each other. And that's going to cause the protein to go into a particular shape. A protein shape determines its function. It's very important uh, concerning proteins, very important concept that we're going to talk about again in another video. And carbohydrates little bit here on carbohydrates. Uh, carbohydrates are made up of monomers called monosaccharides, and those monomers can have different shapes. Here you have uh, three molecules, glucose, galactose, and fructose, that are all have the same chemical formula, but because of their shape, you can see the different shapes, the different orientations of some of the different molecules, just an OH being on the left and not on the right, is going to change the way that this molecule works and behaves with other molecules. And so the properties of carbohydrates can literally be determined by the shape of that molecule, very similar to proteins and nucleic acids. And then lastly, lipids. Lipids uh, can be found in one of two forms. There can be saturated or unsaturated fats. And when it's talking about saturated, we understand the term saturated. When you like a sponge is saturated with water, it's completely full of water. Well, when a fat is saturated, it is completely full of hydrogen. Notice, there are no more hydrogens can be put here. The hydrogens are completely full, whereas down here, because of this double bonded carbon, um, you could put more hydrogen in there theoretically, but that hydrogen, uh, the carbon's double bond, and it causes the uh, fat to be a different shape, whereas these saturated fats can line up in nice, neat rows. The unsaturated fats are unable to do that, and because of this, saturated fats tend to be solid at room temperature, whereas unsaturated fats tend to be liquid. And this leads us to the phospholipid, which is a special kind of lipid, which has a phosphorus phosphate group up here, which is a polar region, and the lipids, which is a nonpolar region. And because of this very specific structure, it allows cells to have and cell membranes to have their shape. So 1.5, dealing with, the again, the structure and function of biological molecules, specifically talking about directionality here, this, this tends to be a confusing portion for a lot of students. Um, it's basically saying that nucleic acids and proteins and carbohydrates, these all these structures have a particular direction, and that direction determines how they're going to be used. Just think of any tool that you use. Uh, you know, if you get a wrench out, the wrench is going to have two different ends and those two different ends have different functions. You can't use one for the other one or you can, it just doesn't work very well. And so a nucleic acid is going to have a particular direction. We typically talk about the direction of nucleic acids concerning the carbons. Each of the carbons have a name and the car there's five carbons in this five carbon sugar here, one, two, three, four, and five prime. And so we say that that 
direction of that is usually associated with the three and the five since they're on this side. And sometimes you'll see things like three prime to five prime or five prime to three prime. Um, when it comes to making new acids, new amino or new nucleic acids, typically bases are added to the three prime end of the molecule, for instance. And so the direction of that molecule is a very important concept when dealing with nucleic acids. You can see here that when the nucleic acids is like DNA is double stranded and it, it lines up together, those two strands actually are anti-parallel, meaning that they're parallel to one another, but they're going in opposite directions. If this didn't work, then, then life wouldn't work because the cells, the way that the DNA is duplicated, the way that the DNA is read during protein synthesis is the directionality is essential. It's just like how a zip tie wouldn't work if, if it went in both directions. It needs to go in one direction for it to work. For it to serve its purpose and very similar to nucleic acids that directionality determines its purpose with proteins very similar we talked about the n terminus and c terminus of amino acids so you have a specific group very important for the structure of proteins proteins are going to start out in this kind of primary structure there you see on the left which is basically like a string of amino acids but because of the individual protein or the individual chemical composition of each one of those amino acids, what you're going to have is you're going to have that protein is going to fold up and it's going to form these secondary structures, which are like helices, these pleated sheets are what they're often called. And those individual helices and sheets are going to join together to form a tertiary structure, which is a three-dimensional protein. For a lot of proteins, this is the end game, right? They become this three-dimensional structure. They have a shape, and that shape determines their function, and they can go out and do some sort of some sort of work. For other proteins, they are multiple tertiary structures joined together, which is what you see there in the lower right-hand corner called the quaternary protein. And then lastly, looking at the directionality of carbohydrates. Again, very important here, as you can see, the difference between the starch, the bottom, and the cellulose. Cellulose has this alternating pattern of oxygen, one going up, one going down, whereas starch are all going down. What is the difference between these two molecules? Well, if I eat starch, my body can digest it just fine. Cellulose, it can't because we don't have the enzymes in human bodies in order to digest cellulose. Cellulose is what makes up a uh, makes up cell walls and is a structural component, whereas starch is a way that plants will store glucose. Starch is a completely different uh, use than cellulose, and the directionality of those carbohydrates are very important there. All Both of those are made up just of glucose, but because they're facing different directions, it allows them to serve different functions. And that is going to bring us to 1.6 nucleic acids, which was a very short section. And it's just dealing again with nucleic acids, again, reminding us that phosphate, nitrogenous base, and 5-carbon sugar are what nucleic acids are made up of. And that's how DNA and RNA are similar. But the difference is, is that 5-carbon sugar is going to be deoxyribose in DNA and ribose in RNA. And that um, thymine is going to be found in DNA, whereas uracil replaces thymine in RNA. And that in RNA is single-stranded, whereas DNA tends to be double-stranded. Hopefully this was helpful. Like and subscribe, please, for my uh, videos. And uh, I have videos for the entirety of the AP Bio curriculum and lots of other things where I solve problems. Um, and if you have a, an idea for a video you'd like for me to make or you have questions about this video, please ask in the comments below. Thank you.